I feel differently toward God and I'm more anxious to go talk to him. I feel like he feels differently toward me. And that's pretty cool. Welcome to the Eden Podcast, where we true the verse of Genesis 3.16, and we discover that God didn't curse Eve or Adam or limit woman in any way. This is True Talk Tuesday. I'm Bruce C.E. Fleming, Executive Director of the True 316 Foundation and the home of the Eden Podcast. Uh, we have a special guest today. She's here all the way from Georgia. Her name is Paula Collins. Welcome, Paula. Thank you, Bruce. I'm excited to be with you here today. Well, let me tell our audience a little bit about you. I've got some really good notes, and it's going to go on and on. I'm going to. I've got the. I've got the short notes here for us. So Paula has a practice called looking upward, moving forward. Paula is a trauma-informed professional counselor, licensed in South Carolina and Georgia. She earned her master's degree in marriage and family therapy from Reformed Theological Seminary in 1998 and works with individuals who seek counseling for depression, anxiety, relationship issues, and healing from trauma. She also works with couples seeking to improve their relationships, and she is certified in EMDR, which I call the wiper method. <laughs> which, <laughs> yes, uh, I don't know if a that's very a cool great... method. <laughs> yeah. So uh, how long have you been doing EMDR? Um, for about five years, I guess. Five yeah. years, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's, that's... Uh, go ahead. Has that been helpful to, to people? Very much so. Yeah. Very much so. I, I love that technique. And actually, um, in the notes I jotted down to talk about, I'm going to share with you how that kind of relates to the work you're doing. Just the use of EMDR. Oh, Okay. So it's yeah. true 316 MDR. <laughs> right. Well, it's related. We'll oh. get there. <laughs> all right. Okay. So first of all, we'd like to start out with your faith story. How did you come to know Christ and, and get growing in him? Yeah. Thanks for the for the question and the opportunity to share that, Bruce. So um, I've been knowing about Jesus all my life and grew up in a Christian home pretty, pretty saturated with the gospel. And yet I really didn't come to know Christ in a saving way until I was 22 years old. And um, that's a long story, which I won't get into all of it. But suffice it to say that I had a, uh, a period of time in my life where I went through some dark times. And um, I had ended up getting married very young. I married at 19 and uh, it was it was an unhappy marriage. And my ex-husband, though he was um, a good man in some ways, also was locked in uh, the slavery of addiction. And so that was a very hard time in my life. But as it turned out, um, I had those dark years, probably about three years where we had been through some really difficult things. And I kind of came to just think that, you know, God couldn't love me and I could never be saved. And I, it was just very hopeless time for me. Um, but praise the Lord, he broke through and uh, the way that he did that was unexpected. I uh, ended up having a very serious car accident. And that was in 1984, so a long time ago. And uh, I was in a car. My son was with me, and he was seven months old at the time. And um, I remember thinking on impact, I I, I hit a semi-tractor trailer truck that was pulled across the road and, like, uh, like a jackknife, his lights were facing me, but I couldn't see the the tractor part because there was no reflection. And it was very dark night in, in February. So anyway, uh, I remember thinking right on impact, I'm going to die and I don't have time to pray. Mm. And that was really the moment that uh, my life really changed. Wow, I didn't expect to get broken up over that today, but it really is uh, 
something you get broken up over that that life and death is so important and to know God in a saving way uh, that changed my life. And so after the accident, what happened was um, I, I was I woke up in the hospital and people came to visit me that I hadn't seen in years and God just poured out his love on me and showed me, yeah, I really do love you. And so after that, he gave me the courage to uh, get up and get moving to start to face the problems that I had in my life and in my marriage. And he surrounded me by people who loved me. Mm -hmm. And um, that was great. Mm -hmm. So, so thankful for that. And for knowing him truly, he, he um, completely changed my life. He gave me a clean heart. I was able to confess my sin to him and feel completely forgiven to go to those people that I had harmed and to make that right. And I can't tell you how, how that completely changed my life to have a clean slate. It's amazing. So there are all kinds of details there. I'm sure that's a, that's a, first of all, that we're so glad it turned out the way it did. Yes. And your little one. And my little one, yeah, he uh, he was fine. Uh -huh. And that was the miracle. Uh -huh. You know, when it first happened, I thought, um, I woke up in the car with the ambulance siren. And when the man came to the door, I was just freaked. I thought that my son was dead. Uh -huh. And I wouldn't believe him that he was alive. And uh, he had to convince me. So he brought him over and showed him to me. Uh -huh. And then I believed him. But yeah. I was told that if we had gone 12 inches to the right or the left, we would have both been beheaded. Oh, my. Yeah. So so I know, I know mm -hmm. that God intended for us both to live. Yeah. And that's a wonderful thing. So he, we take that seriously. He did intend for you to live. And uh, that leads us to our second question, which is, what is your ministry story? How has... How has God, now it doesn't have to be professional when God has a ministry story. It could be, you know, how he uses your spiritual gifts in your life in a professional way or in a personal way. But I think you've got a professional story for sure to tell us about. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, in my practice, I I feel so privileged to be able to do this work, to sit with people, to have them grant me the privilege of coming into that inner sanctuary where they have um, real deep hurts and and deep problems, and they need somebody to really hear them. And I just consider that a huge blessing in my life. I I love doing that work, and I learn from my clients every day. And so that's that's a big piece of what I do. I do individual and couple work, and I also do some groups um, and. I really do enjoy all of it in different ways. But as far as personal goes, um, I guess uh, I, I really value friendship. I think that uh, friendship may be one of the things that um, God enables me to do. I really want to be a good friend to people. And um, I want to be a listener. I want to be a hearer. And I want to think right. I mean, I think that's part of what draws me to the work you've been doing. That um, I think our our work and our help to other people grows out of what's the basis of our thinking. And what do we believe about God? What has he shown us in our life that we can share? So that's pretty cool. So there are lots of counselors in this world. What makes you different as a counselor? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Well, um, I think what's made me different, especially in recent years, um, I have had some life experiences that have really humbled me. And I know that I am no, no better than anybody else. I am I have no special powers. I have no um, ability to fix people. I simply can do 
what God directs me to do with the gifts he's given me. And I think in recent years where I've really grown is in the area of abuse. I have learned a great deal about abuse. I've learned about um, forms of abuse that aren't always obvious and that other people might not pick up on and how it happens in marriages and, and in parents and children and different scenarios. But um, I think maybe that's something that makes me different. So along, along the way, you happened into, <clears throat> into our one of our workshops called uh, the Beyond Eden Workshop on Ephesians 5 and 6. And uh, let, let's go from there. Let's use that as our, our starting point for your True 316 story. Great. I, I enjoyed that so much. How did you find out about us, first of all? And then, and then what did you find in that workshop? Yeah. So I had been, you know, as I said, really getting educated more about abuse. And I was following uh, several other people. Uh, Sheila Ray Gregoire is one of them. Mm -hmm. um, I was following Natalie Hoffman. Um, let's see, I, I'm sure I'm going to leave out important people because uh, I'm not going to sit here and read my notes. <laughs> but anyway, um, those come to mind. Sarah McDougall and um, there are a few others. But uh, I heard your podcast mentioned several times and I thought, okay, well, um, that's more than once. I guess I'll go check that out. And so I did. And I began to listen. And I have to say that at first, um, you know, as a person who, who loves to study the Bible and has sat under a lot of preaching over, over the years, um, at first, I thought, well, you know, there's a big part of me that would like to believe that's true. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know. Maybe they're, maybe they really just want this to be true. And so I really had to dig in and I really had to, you know, get out my Bible and start struggling with it and see where it led. So, <laughs> We we started the Eden podcast going through the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter two, carefully, Genesis chapter three, eight episodes later, I asked the Lord, what do I do next? And uh, Joy's research was on Genesis and my research was on Ephesians and first Timothy. And so I thought, well, Lord, let's do season number two on uh, on Ephesians five and six, which turned into the the book ta -da, beyond yes. beyond yes. Eden. Yes, uh, I, I also have mine. <laughs> yeah, do you? Okay, <laughs> Ephesians 5, 15 to 6, 9. And then, then we moved on to several others. And uh, one of our Bible study fellowship friends, a volunteer uh, for a long time, uh, Joanne said, well, let's let's put some study guides to that and uh, let's turn that into, you know, the, the podcast into a book. And then Mimi came along and she says, well, why don't we turn that into a workshop? And so... <laughs> If you go to true316.com, you're going to find links to all of this. But um, you said you made a comment to Mimi that you this kind of helps you in your in your therapy work. What? How do you apply these verses now uh, in a new way? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, so it's amazing how um, how all of this really relates to abuse, which is something you've pointed out in your podcast that. Um, you know, uh, what if it's true that um, Adam decided to rule over Eve? What if it's true that um, that was not God's command to him? And what if it's true that all this time, We've been studying our Bibles and believing that, well, you know, this doesn't feel right, but, you know, the Bible says he's supposed to rule over me. And this is what women have been struggling with. And so when you go to Ephesians and you read the passages on uh, submission and you read that and, well, once again, this it's the same attitude of heart. 
And I think it's this, this attitude of heart that I really long to see changed among Christians. And I really like your teaching because, for one, you're just taking the Word of God and you're unpacking it. You're not upset. You're not angry. You're not, you know, yeah. you know where I'm going with that. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's what we should be doing. We should be opening our Bibles and saying, God, show me who you are. Show me. Show me. I want to know you. This is the excitement of studying the word, and I just love it. And, and, you know, when we were doing Ephesians, there was one verse that I read in my interlinear Bible. And I think I said this to you when you came on the podcast. It was the 30th verse, I think. I don't have it in front of me. But it said something to the effect of, and it's talking about the body of Christ. And it used that same bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh phrase as Adam used in the garden. Well, that started me down a whole other rabbit trail. And I started unpacking. Well, it looks to me like Ephesians and Genesis are like parallel, which you do bring out in your Bible study. And I could see it. There it is. You know, Adam was the first man. He was, um, it talks about his body and Eve came out of his body. Now we're the body of Christ. It's the second Adam. He's the head. We're the, the body. And it talks about how um, we're to be together. This, um, you know, this uh, kind of new submission that he talks about. It's the horizontal thing. And first of all, I'm thinking, wow, this is so cool. You know, it's cross-shaped because there's the vertical where he, it's the uh, God over us, but then it's the horizontal, that submission. We submit to God and we submit to each other. It's mm -hmm. cross-shaped. Mm -hmm. And like one cool thing after another just started appearing to me yeah. in doing your study. Yeah, a lot of people weaponize this passage in a bad way because they think that uh god told adam like you said told the man you go rule over her <laughs> and he didn't tell right. him that at all he says that to her look out he's going to rule over you he's been rebellious he's rejected my rule over him and now he's going to usurp my rule over you and he's going to presume to rule over you and somehow they think that's the pattern that we're supposed to follow so then they take that wrong interpretation and they paste it over Ephesians 5 and 6. And you've heard me say this before. They <clears throat> Commentators say that Ephesians 5 and 6 is the longest passage on marriage in Paul's epistles. And it's not about marriage. <laughs> it's, it's not. No. It's not no. about marriage. So the 532 is where Paul says, I've got this great mystery. And in New Testament passage terms, a mystery is something that was previously hidden and is now revealed. So I've got yeah. this great revelation. I'm talking about Christ and the church being united in one joint body. So now if that's my key point, the whole passage has to be interpreted in light of that, that were all of my previous ideas in line with that, that Christ and the church are one flesh. Well, now you go back to Ephesians 5.18, be being filled with the spirit, overflowing, bubbling over, submitting to what? Well, speaking, teaching, uh, admonishing one another, 519A, submitting to that teaching and correction you get from other Christians, that's the horizontal reciprocal submission. And all of that fits in that we are one in Christ when you get down to 532. And people who say, well, wives, you should submit to your husbands. Well, no, that's an illustration of how wives and husbands are reciproc Christian wives and husbands are reciprocally submitting one to another as an illustration of how the church gets along. Well, if you take that seriously, then you just took away this, this mm, wife submit to me because I'm the guy, you know, that, that mistaken hierarchical thought, that possibly abusive kind of uh, domination. 
that's that's not part of the passage. You realize it's not even there, and you go, "Well, I can't base I can't base my misbehavior on that." <laughs> and, right, and, and it's not just women. It's not just against women. It's against children, and the rest of Ephesians brings that out. Yeah, I can tell you've taken the course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, I mean, it's very eye opening to really realize. I call it the fruit of the poisonous tree. You know, it, like in a legal sense, if you're arguing a case, well, you can't bring that argument in because that has been already excluded. That's, that's not right. Yeah. And what we're doing is we're interpreting scripture according to the fruit of the poisonous tree, which is Genesis 3.16, which your wife has researched and uh, so beautifully written about. It's, um, it's amazing to me, the ramifications, and honestly, for men as well. I mean, I have talked to men who, who quite honestly feel overwhelmed by what they're expected to do. Uh, uh, in many ways, uh, men are made to feel responsible for things they're not responsible for. Um, it's the same way women are. I mean, men are sometimes made to feel that they're responsible for their wife's spiritual life, you know? And I don't know what you would say about that, but I would say we're each responsible for our own. I don't think that when I meet God in the end that he's going to ask me, well, did you obey your husband? He's probably going to be a lot more interested in whether I believe that he died for me. Mm -hmm. And I think it's the same for men. You know, they're going to be answering for themselves, not for anyone else. And have you experienced the relationship, you know, that I, I offered you, you know, it, God, God sent Christ into the world to save us and to redeem us so that we can have that great one flesh relationship with him again. Yeah, you, you're picking up ideas. Again, people read the last couple of verses in Ephesians 5 before they get to that key verse, and they and they think that husbands have to they have to take care of their wife's wrinkles and spots. And, <laughs> and he's not talking about that at all. He's talking about how Christ cares for his own body of the church. Well, there are there are ways to interpret and there are ways to misinterpret it. And um we're just trying to true the verse in Genesis 3:16 and then the related passages. Somebody gave me the illustration. If you're riding a bicycle along and you hit a bump and you bang into a wall and your front wheel gets all bent out of shape and on the way home, if you can even ride, you know, it's not a very good ride. The wheel is wobbling back and forth. And when you get home, you get the little wrench out and you adjust all the different spokes and you true the wheel, you make it straight. And so what we're trying to do is to true the verse of Genesis 3.16 and related passages. And then that allows us, now the Bible is a tool, tool. The Bible gives us good truths that we can apply to our lives in the counseling session, as well as in the uh, sanctuary or in the Bible study group or in our own private devotions. Yeah. It's supposed to bring healing and balance. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I had one more thought that I had promised in the beginning. I was going to tell you how it relates to yes. EMDR. Yes, okay. Um, so if you think of, uh, I don't know how much you know about EMDR, but it's um, it's a modality in counseling that works with people's irrational beliefs. And so it treats trauma and it is based on the idea that our trauma is affecting us the way it is, not so much because of the actual event, but because of what we've come to believe about ourselves because of the event. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about it, our core beliefs about ourselves and how we relate to God, are they're just foundational. They're so important. And, you know, many of the traumas that we have in our life may be spiritual. I mean, we may uh, attached to some event in our life have developed uh, beliefs about God that, for instance, in my own life, that he could never love me. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so all of these things are, are tied up together with fixing that belief that was never true. In other words, that God didn't design us to uh, be hierarchical over each other, to put each other down or have control over each other. He created us to be partners in this world, to be members of the church who have this sort of horizontal um, submission. And we may be married or we may, may not be married. And either position is good, right? Um, it's not all about marriage in this life. Uh, a lot of people never have been married. And I think there's also this sort of um, lack of awareness about other people and their their position in life. But a lot of it re relates back to the fruit of that poisonous tree. And do we see God as mean and angry and he's vindictive toward women and he doesn't really like women um maybe we do maybe we think that about god because of the way we've been treated in life and what we've come to be taught about the bible mm -hmm. and so i just see your teaching as so wonderful in that way well i've had we've had people say to us i used to i used to be upset with eve and I used to be upset with God and I put my Bible down and I even left the church. And then I somehow I came across your podcast and now I, I've understood better what's going on. And I'm back in church. I'm reading my Bible and Eve is my hero. <laughs> so there, there are a lot of good things there once you get it balanced out. The word of God is good. It's true. It makes us well, right? Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. And I do uh, on the positive side of that. Um, the other thing that EMDR is not only does it, um, D, you know, take the power out of those irrational beliefs, but it, it empowers the positive beliefs that we need to believe about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so on that side of things, one thing I have noticed since I've been studying your books and listening to your podcast is I feel differently toward God and I'm more anxious to go talk to him. I feel like he feels differently toward me. And that's pretty cool. That's, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's called a mic drop. <laughs> that's pretty cool. We'll stop there. We've got some links and some bio material. So if people like to get to know more about you, we'll, we'll be able to refer them to that. Excellent. And uh, let's keep in touch and, and stay, stay uh, working the same road together of healing for all of our brothers and sisters in the Lord and those who get to know the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Bye. True 316 Foundation is the home of the Eden Podcast. Join us for $3.16 a month or more. Let's true the verses on the key passages on women and men. Go to true316.com slash partner.